local community and using the power of your imagination, which we'll be doing lots of tonight. Um, and it's, it's all about, transition is all about local people doing things, ordinary local people, just like the rest, just like all of us, just doing extraordinary things. And uh, I think Rob's talk will hopefully inspire us for that. But the second part, we'll be getting you involved a lot more and you'll be using your imagination. So uh, anyway, let's get started and over to you, Rob. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's lovely to be here in Bude, albeit virtually. And thank you all for, for coming along. Uh, so I want to just start with a little, uh, a little imagination exercise for you, which is that I'm going to show you in a moment an object and we will take a minute and a half uh, for you to think of as many different uses for that object as possible. Bearing in mind this is not school, there are no right answers. I'm not coming with some list of uh, these are the right answers. So they can be as eclectic and, and mad and whatever as you like, but as many as you can come up with and to put them into the chat box. If you open your little chat box there, which is uh, down at the bottom of your screen where it says chat. So I'm gonna show you an object and we'll just spend a minute and a half trying to fill the chat with a stream of consciousness of as many different uses for this object as possible. Okay, is that all clear? Everybody ready? Your object is a, a construction helmet as worn by builders uh, across the country. A minute and a half, go. Po, what's a po? <laughs> Scooping a leaky dingy. There's definitely a lavatorial theme emerging here. <clears throat> House building, very good, lateral thinking. A mini igloo. Any more? nest canvas oh what for like for painting on refill shop scoops very nice cloche for a lettuce or for a dead lettuce rain collection very good a slide for small people fantastic oh, powers oh i see very good thank you very much a sick bucket well, thank you. Thank you all very much for doing that. I, I, I did this the, the, with a group yesterday and someone said you could make it really, really big and use it to like a candle snuffer to snuff out the sun, which I quite like that one as well. Um, so the reason I like to start with this exercise is to just start to kind of uh, limber the imagination up a little bit, because imagination is going to be the, 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 the subject that I want to discuss with you. Can you see that? Are, are those clear? You can see my pictures? Cool. Good. Okay. So, um, so I want to talk to you about imagination and why it's so important when we're when we're talking about climate change. And so I just want to start with just a minute or so of what Extinction Rebellion movement would call "Tell the Truth." You know, just a little snapshot of where we are now and uh, and why why this is a climate and ecological emergency. You know, we are now living in. The climate and ecological emergency its no longer something that we talk about that might happen in the future or when climate change happens. You know, we're, we're well in now into a process of are already seeing at 1.1 degrees increase on pre-industrial levels, things happening that weren't supposed to be happening for really quite some time, apocalyptic fires, um, ice melting floods, um, uh, kind of an on-rolling and ever-increasing litany of dreadful things. Well, we've only really just started this process and um, we've lost, uh, we lose 200 species a day. Since I was born, we've lost 70% of the creatures we share this planet with. There are 8 million species on the earth and 1 million of them are, are, are at risk of extinction. You know, this is not a time anymore when moving in short little incremental steps is in any way an option. 
as Naomi Klein says, there are no non-radical solutions left. So it's really about thinking big and bold. And this crisis really uh, gives us no option. And the way that I like to think about it is, and I'm not showing you this as a graph, don't worry, it's far too late. We've all had far too long a day to look at graphs. I'm showing you this more as a story in that here we are in 2020, we stand on top of this mountain and beneath our feet is more carbon, more debt, more inequality, more plastic, uh, more, more anxiety than we've ever seen before. Uh, and the view up here is amazing and we, we have experiences that no one else has ever had before. But the experienced guides who are at our side are saying, we need to get down off this mountain really, really quickly. Look over there. Can you see the storm that's coming in? We need to get down off this mountain. And some people trust the guides enough uh, to, uh, to say, OK, let's get down off the mountain then. For a lot of people, I feel like the, the, the big work that we need to do is to be able to tell the stories about the lower slopes, the, uh, the, the, the valleys that await us at the bottom of this mountain and to tell the stories about the, the welcome that, awakes, uh, that awaits us there, how extraordinary it is, the delicious food and welcome uh, and celebration that awaits us when we get there. If we can create a longing, a deep, deep longing for that place, then it makes it inevitable that we will move towards it. And that is not uh, that is not the work of storytelling. No, sorry, that's not the work of facts and figures and numbers and policies, because if it was, we would have done this in the 1980s. And as you see here, it would have been so, so much easier. This needs to be a work of storytelling, of imagination, of creating longing for that place. And I think if, if there's anything that my work is about these days in transition movement, it's really about how do we cultivate longing for that future? When we went to the moon, we didn't go to the moon because it was Neil Armstrong's idea or JFK's idea. We had been going to the moon for decades before that in story, in song, Tintin went to the moon, Frank Sinatra sang us to the moon. We created in our culture such a deep longing to get to the moon that it became inevitable that we would. And when we decided that we would, we did it from scratch in eight years. And that's the, the and cultivating that longing, longing is fundamentally important. And in the transition movement of which Transition Viewed is, is part and a wonderful uh, part of, um, it's one of the things that we really try to do is to give people now in 2020 a taste of what that future will be like. Uh, what would a future be like where we had done everything we could possibly do? And how do we give people a taste of that in small projects like just planting trees and starting gardens and seed saving to bigger things like uh, co-housing projects and community energy schemes to some of the bigger again projects that I'm going to go on to talk about. That bit as communities that we can do when we come together with other people around us, what can we create and how do we give people now a taste of what that future would smell like and taste like and and as i went when i went to visit transition crystal palace in london who had started a food market which won all the awards in london for the best food market and i said why do you do this and they said we do it because we want our children to grow up thinking that this is normal and that work that that, that transition groups do is so 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 important why imagination? Why am I not talking about policy or uh, activism or different, uh, different aspects of this? I think talking about imagination is really important because I kept reading people like Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben and people I really respect at all who write about climate change, who kept saying climate change is a failure of the imagination. This, this term, it kept coming up in different places. It kind of got underneath my skin. I was thinking, why are we having a failure of the imagination? in 2020. If climate change demands anything of us, it's that we need to reimagine and rebuild many, many aspects of, of, of our society. As the uh, IPCC say, we need to see rapid, urgent and far reaching changes in all aspects of society. The human imagination is an extraordinary thing. Uh, John Dewey, the educationalist, defined it as the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise, which feels to me like the superpower that we absolutely need to be uh, nourishing right now. I, uh, I, I did some research. Uh, I found some research that was done in, um, uh, in uh, that was published in 2010, which looked at this thing called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is very similar to the test that we did with my um, builder's helmet just then where you show people an object and say think of as many alternative uses as 
that's been done with big groups of people going back to the 1960s. And this research suggested that, I, that IQ and imagination had been risen together until the mid 1990s, at which point IQ had kept rising and imagination had gone into a decline which the researcher blamed on the decline of play in our culture, the rise of screens and the rise of testing uh, in schools. And it made me think, actually, in many ways in 2020, we are creating a kind of a perfect storm of things that are ruinous to the imagination. And I'll touch on some of those later. One of the things I often encounter is people who say, who just, who discount the idea that change is possible. The business as usual, the way we know things today is the only way we can possibly do things. I, this is a picture that I love from the late 1960s in the US. The first thing I always noticed in this picture is how slim everybody is. But the second thing is that actually this was, a, this was at a time when if you went to the beach, you could park your car on the beach. It was completely socially acceptable that everybody went to the beach and they parked their car on the beach. There must have been a time when it was decided that that wasn't actually a very good idea and that actually people's lives would be improved hugely by not having beaches covered in cars. And I'm sure then there would have been people who said, oh, I can't imagine going to the beach without being able to park my car on the beach. That's, that's just completely not okay. But we would all now agree that going to the beach is a far better experience without it being covered in cars. And change happens really fast and change happens uh, all the time. This girl here standing in the Netherlands at the bus stop in 1982 had no way of knowing that by 2020 her street would be looking like this with bike paths and trees and much less cars. You know, the, the, this we are capable of changing things and but we need to change things an awful lot faster than this and there are many many stories of rapid change and rapid transition and i think we're living through one of those times now because of covid and the collapse of the cruise ship industry we're now seeing a lot of cruise ships uh, being broken up and being scrapped because people don't believe that the cruise ship industry is ever going to come back again good riddance i would suggest and i and i think the same thing we'll be seeing the same thing with with airplanes uh, before long as well and this uh, these sort of shifts are happening around us we're living through such a time one of my favorite stories uh, a rapid transition which is from a, a book called how did we get here by the rapid transition alliance who gather stories of rapid transition is from is from our part of the country in the southwest of england so in 19, in 1892 there was a weekend where they started work at 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning and they finished at 4 a.m. on Monday morning. And a team of 4,200 people laid 160 miles of railway track over one weekend. When we decide to do things and we decide to move, we can move mountains and do phenomenal things. But we have to start by putting the longing in place for that to be reality. And I think, you know, all too often as environmental campaigners and climate people who care about climate change, we start by thinking, right, we need to find the most terrifying images we can and throw them at people and they'll go, oh, my God, I need to change. That works for some people. It works for me. For a lot of people, it doesn't work. I think when you show people terrifying stuff, it's too much and it's overload and people switch off and zone out and sort of numb themselves. And actually, I love this is the work of a guy called James Mackay, who is based at the University of Leeds. And he he's his job is he's a graphic artist who, who makes science understandable to people. But one of the things he does is he draws the future. He's, I always think of him. He's the man who draws the future and he draws. He lives in Leeds. He draws places in Leeds, but then he turns them into how he thinks they could be in 10 or 15 years time. So this is his drawing of Leeds. If Leeds became the most biodiverse city uh, in the country, if now they set out to maximize, create the perfect conditions to maximize biodiversity in the city, what could it look like in 10 years time? It could look like this. Of course it could. Absolutely. Why not? This is his idea of what the, what it would look like, what cities would look like if we took the cars out and we grew food there instead. We dedicate so much land to cars. In the city of Los Angeles, two thirds of the surface area of LA is dedicated to cars. Many cities now, because of COVID, are starting to design cars uh, out of the city. Milan is uh, putting in loads and loads of, of pedestrianised areas and cycle paths. And uh, when you do that and you take space back from the cars, 
what do you then do with that space you know we could be filling it with play and and community and food being grown like this and our children walk to school through streets where food is being grown already in paris just in the last couple of years through changes they've made the amount of people cycling and and uh, and walking in paris has grown absolutely hugely and and last year the 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 mayor of paris uh, they found that the underground car parks in Paris were being used so little, they ran a competition for underground car park, alternative uses for underground car parks. And they're now filling up with people growing mushrooms and storing wine and growing salads under lights. You know, when we start to move the cars out of the way, we open so much uh, new possibility. This is a little video clip. I was in Luxembourg two weeks ago, uh, which is why I'm now uh, quarantining in my house and, until next Monday. And I went there to the premiere of a film called One Earth. And I don't know if you'll be able to hear the audio, but it doesn't matter because he's talking Luxembourgish anyway, which not that many. The, the thing to watch is there's, there's an animation that comes in over him speaking, which I... that lovely i love that i i think we need more of those things that actually help us to imagine what places could be we get so stuck with the idea of um of things being as they are and not able to see beyond that and everything we can do to help people to imagine uh what if rather than what is is really really important so i want to share something with you this evening uh which is this so I wrote the book uh, From What Is to What If, which came out in October uh, about imagination. <coughs> I, when I was writing it, I was sharing uh, that I had a tenant in my house who was studying at Schumacher College and he was doing his dissertation and he was really excited about the book. And I gave him the manuscript of the book to read and he did his dissertation based on it. And in conversations that we had while he was doing that, together we created this thing, which, I, which we call the Imagination Sundial. And it's something which I hope that after this talk is something that you'll be able to take away and make use of and, and uh, it will hopefully be something useful to underpin and inform your work. And I'm happy to send the slides uh, to the group if you want to distribute them or on my blog, which is robhopkins.net. There's a whole article about the sundial where you can that goes into it in a lot more detail. But it's our attempt to try and answer the question of um, if we, if we recognize that we are living in a time of imaginative poverty and in a perfect storm of factors that are causing our collective imagination to shrink, such as stress, anxiety, trauma, loneliness, we know all of those things impact the hippocampus, the part of the brain where the imagination fires from and cause it to shrink and reduce our imaginative capacity. We know that colonization and systemic racism and systemic inequality uh, create the conditions for the imagination to, 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 to contract. We know that if our basic needs on Maslow's hierarchy of needs for food and shelter and safety and security aren't met, it's also very hard to have an imaginative life. Imagination to a degree is a kind of a, a function of privilege. And so what would it look like if we set out across society to create the best conditions for the imagination to flourish? And so the, there are four key aspects of this space, place, practices and pacts. And what I wanna do is to go through each of those and tell you some stories about each of those to kind of bring them to life for you. So the first one is space. We all know that in our own lives, we, our imagination needs space. Our best ideas tend not to come to us sitting in front of our laptop, stressed at five o'clock in the afternoon with a deadline at eight o'clock that night. Albert Einstein always said his best ideas came to him when he rode his bicycle in the forest. Uh, and but with that kind of space, that daydreaming kind of imaginative space is, is becoming harder and harder for most people to keep in their lives. We work such long hours, uh, we fill any space that we do have with Facebook and Netflix. The chief executive of Netflix now says that the chief, uh, that the, the chief competition 
that Netflix faces sleep. Uh, and uh, so designing space into our lives and into our organizations is really important. I think the transition movement and Extinction Rebellion and other movements are getting really good now at designing space into themselves as organizations to say, we don't just meet as colleagues with an agenda to get through. We meet as friends who care about each other and we start with a check-in and we put in space for, uh, for, for, for sharing and for what if and for whatever we need to have the space for. And so creating, designing space into how we work as organizations is really important. And as communities to create space for these things is really important too. This is in Totnes just before the lockdown. We did a big event called Totnes Declares Climate Emergency, What Next? Uh, where we did a big what if space and really well facilitated event to try and work with ideas about, so where do we go from here? What, what are the ideas that are really current now? These kind of spaces don't occur generally otherwise. They don't occur in school, they don't occur in universities, they rarely occur in, in workplaces. You know, communities can come together and hold and facilitate those really, really precious what if spaces in a way that very few other organizations will. And when I was researching the book, I was really keen to go a bit further into what I said before about the researcher who said that it was partly because we've seen a decline of play, that we've seen a decline of imagination. <clears throat> and um, children playing in the street was a, was a, a fact of, of, was a part of everyone's reality in the 60s and early 80s I guess when I grew up we played outside all the time actually it's pretty much disappeared now and the former mayor of Bogota in Colombia used to say that we should see the number of children playing in the streets of our cities as being a key well-being indicator uh, for the for, of, of those cities uh, of, yeah so so I, I wanted to see well where can I find a place where people are creating space so that play can come back again so I went to Bristol where they have a project called Playing Out, where 60 streets across Bristol, once a week during the summer and once every couple of weeks during the winter, close the street so that children can come and play. Between particular hours, the city council have made it really, really straightforward. You just, uh, you just block out all the days for a year and you submit once rather than submitting for every time. So I visited a street in St George in Bristol on a Wednesday evening, and the street was full of kids playing and skipping and bicycles and, and drawing with chalk all over the place. It was just fantastic. I spoke to one of the mums who said, this is just what happens when you get the cars out of the way. Um, and one of the dads said to me, well, after six months of doing this, we realised that we actually quite liked each other. You know, you started to get a sense of how streets full of children was one of the key ways that communities interacted with each other and depended on each other. And when all the kids retreated indoors, the, the, the social fabric really started to unravel. So seeing that thing of how they intentionally set out to make space was, was, was a really beautiful thing. So the first one is space. And I think we need to be looking at things like a universal basic income and a, a, a three or four day working week as being national imagination strategies uh, as much as anything else. Um, can you hear the noisy people outside my room? Can you picking that up? So I have a house full of young teenage men, just a second. Excuse me. So the second one is place. So play, what I mean by place is places that we go to and we visit where afterwards when we leave our sense of what's possible changes that we visit a place and when we go back we look at the place that we've come from with with new eyes and we see its possibilities in new ways this is uh, waterloo bridge in london and uh last april during the april rebellion extinction rebellion took over this bridge for uh two weeks and they planted a forest <clears throat> down the middle of it they turned it into a forest and so uh, normally this bridge is just traffic backwards and forwards and people walking to work through horrible air noisy traffic for those two weeks that bridge was turned into a forest and uh, my wife was there for the whole two weeks she's very involved in extinction rebellion she's been arrested four times now i'm very proud of her and uh, she and um she told me many many stories of talking to people who are office workers on the bridge who would say oh, this is what this is so beautiful why can't it always be like this you know and i think once you give people a taste of how things could be 
uh, it's for, it's very hard for them to go back to seeing things to, to see things as they were and these kind of pop-up tastes of the future i like to think of them as a kind of pop-up tomorrow are really really important because they shift our sense of what's possible this is uh, in Paris, where I was a few uh, a week before last, where in the suburb of, of Paris called Pré Saint Gervais, the transition group there, who are amazing, transitions Pré Saint Gervais en transition. They have a project called the Urban Forest, where they want to create on a site which is earmarked for luxury housing, uh, a new urban forest. And they're campaigning. They do like massive sort of street demonstrations, not against something, but for. Uh, a new urban forest and they talk about the urban forest as being for it's good for biodiversity it's good for the climate in Paris which is gets very very hot now the the amount of days above 40 uh, increases every year in Paris so to have forests in the middle of the city is really important for keeping people alive actually uh, in some cases but I think it's also a really powerful imagination project to create a new forest in the middle of the city this sort of uh, forests are so so deep in our psyche i love this is the work of an austrian artist who just makes forests in completely unexpected places this is the forest that he made in the middle of a football stadium uh, in austria uh, and i love these sort of things where we it changes our sense uh, of what might be possible this guy here in the picture is called jason roberts he's a friend of mine who lives in houston he's amazing he runs a project called better block and what Better Block do <clears throat> is they go to a place like this, which nobody loves. Nobody loves this. And they talk to the people around and they say, what do you love? What does this place need? And then they go back to their workshop, their laboratory, and they work and they create a whole load of different stuff. And then one day they arrive at dusk. <clears throat> and they work all through the night and no one knows they're coming. And the next day when people arrive at that place, they've transformed it into this. They've turned it into a place with colour and smells and sights and a place for, for communities to come together and to do things. <clears throat> a place for people to have little businesses and a place where they can get food. And I love this sense that you take somewhere that people know, and you transform it to give them a taste of, of, of how the future could be if we, if we did everything that we no one's talking about utopia here. I always hate when people say to me, oh, you're talking about utopia. I'm not talking about utopia. I'm talking about what the future could be like in 10 years time if we did everything that we could possibly do, that we have to do. And how can we bring it alive for people now? This is a thing that I love, which is um, started in San Francisco with a group of artists who came together and who said, where can we find affordable exhibition space? In San Francisco, really difficult thing to find. And then after some conversation, one of them said, um, if we bought a ticket for a car parking space, is there a rule that says we have to put a car in it? I mean, actually, if you bought a ticket for a car parking space and you just curled up in it and went to sleep, oh, that would be all right, wouldn't it? If you, you bought a ticket for it. So that so they started this event called Parking Day. Where, the, where loads of different people go down into town and they buy a ticket for the car parking space and they fill it with random things. Some use it to exhibit their art. Some of them turn them into, into little mini yoga studios. Some of them uh, play games in them. People make amazing gardens or little cafes. I think some people got married in one a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, they do this. I have absolutely no idea what this is, but it doesn't really matter. You know, they, they take these spaces and it, and it gives you a it gives you a shift in terms of what what is this space and, and what so we can take even small spaces and use them to to give people a taste and sometimes that that place can be a mobile place this is a project that was developed uh, here in Totnes that i was part of in the early in the early days of it called chrysalis which is a mobile cabinet of curiosities which is a truck that can turn into a classroom, it can turn into a cinema, and everywhere it goes it collects kind of little curious uh, things from local people and uh, it, it becomes more and more a, a kind of a, a cabinet of curiosities that is a, a, a kind of a, um, what do you call it, like a, an attractor for the imagination wherever it goes. Uh, so so, so it, can be, it can be a mobile thing sometimes. There's a, when I was in France recently, there's a thing called Alternativa, which is an organization mostly of young people who travel around every year. They travel around France on bicycles and they go to little places that nobody really generally goes to. And in every place they set up for two weeks and they hold these inquiries into the future and what's possible. And so many places I go to, I meet projects that were inspired and left behind 
by alternativa. So a sort of mobile imagination is really important. And sometimes towns or cities themselves can be those kind of places. And in, 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 in Totnes, sometimes, you know, it's something that we try to do, but to, have, to be a place where people come and they see so many interesting things and, and they get a, they get a, a really um, visceral sense of, of what this future could be like, that they go home and look at their own place in a very different way. This is one of my favorites of those places, which is in uh, the Alsace in the northeast of France, in a former mining area uh, called Ungersheim. And in Ungersheim in the early 80s, all the mining closed a bit like here, and they had many of the problems associated with when, when a big monocultural employer disappears, lots of unemployment and so on. And uh, they had a mayor called Jean-Claude Mensch who had been a miner, his father had been a miner. Jean-Claude had been a trade union organizer for the mines. And in, he became the mayor in 2010. And in 2012, somebody showed him a film about transition called In Transition 2.0, which some of you might have seen. And at the end of it, he said, let's do that, all of that. And now when you go to Ungersheim, it is the most phenomenal example, living, breathing example of transition. They have the biggest solar farm in the region. They turned all the street lighting to, to low energy. Uh, they, the, all loads of the public buildings are run on, on renewables. They created a, a, a new market garden that trains young people to grow food, which produces all the food for the local schools. All the food is 100% organic in the local schools. The building you see in the top right hand corner is a building they call a conservatory, which is uh, taking the produce from the market garden and value adding it and turning it into jams and passata and different things that's creating more jobs for people. They have a local currency called the radish. They, uh, they have a heritage grains project where they grow uh, old grains for the, for the bakery in the town. It's just fantastic. And one of my favorite things was that they sold their school bus and they bought a horse instead. And the kids get taken to school drawn by horse in this thing. And then when the kids are at school, the horse goes off to the market garden, does some plowing and some stuff, and then goes back and takes the kids home. And, uh, and when I was there, I did a talk and uh, pretty much everybody in the, in the village came. And at the end, this, this guy came up to me, he's about 70, said, oh, this transition stuff is great. He said, but that horse is a bit much. <laughs> I said, what do you mean the horse is a bit much? He said, oh, well, the horse feels like we're going backwards. I said, but does it? I said, I spent today going around the place in, a, in, in the horse-drawn thing. I said, it's magic. I, I saw the kids go to school in it today. They were smiling from here to here. I never smiled like that when I got on the bus to go to school. You know, surely there must be some space for, for magic in all of this. So places like Ungersheim are really precious because people go and there, there was a film called What Are We Waiting For that was made about Ungersheim and has been shown all over France and has inspired many, many people uh, to start doing transition because of the story of that place. So places in terms of towns and settlements can be really important. So we've had space, we've had place. Uh, both of those things are fundamental. The third one is practices. And I mentioned before about the hippocampus, this part of the brain where our imagination and also our memory uh, fire from. And in many ways, imagination and memory are the same thing. When you're being imaginative, what you're doing is you're rummaging around in your memory bank and going, oh, there's that and that bit. What happens if I put those two things together and make something new? And so the more we've seen and the more we've read and the more examples of positive change we know, the easier it is uh, to imagine a different a, a different future. Um, the thing with the hippocampus is that, is, as I said, it, it shrinks. It, it is particularly vulnerable to cortisol. When we are ang ang anxious or in stress, it can shrink. People with post-traumatic stress disorder, their hippocampus is often about 20% smaller uh, than average. And so I was really interested to see, could I find a place where they were intentionally setting out to rebuild the, the, the hippocampus, a kind of a, a campus for the hippocampus, if you like. And I went to Dundee and in Dundee, there is a project called Art Angel on the first floor of an office block in the city, run by this amazing woman called Rosalie Summerton. What they do at Art Angel is they work with people with mental health problems, with uh, stress, burnout, anxiety, and they say, and sometimes those people refer themselves, sometimes they're referred by mental health services. They say, when you walk through the door here, you're not a patient, you're not a client, you're an artist who is preparing work for an exhibition. And every year in the biggest gallery in Dundee, they put on an exhibition. 
and I went up there for the day and everybody knew I was coming and they were really happy to, to tell me their stories. Uh, one woman said, I spent the last four years in my pajamas. And even though I have two beautiful small children, six months ago, I came that close to taking my own life. And, um, and since I've been coming here, I can see the future again. Uh, I'm now planning this, I'm planning that. I spoke to one guy who had worked in local government for 30 years and uh, he had then had a had a nervous breakdown and had very low self-esteem. And I said, so um, do you think of yourself as an artist? And he paused and said, aye, why not? You know, you, you could see how people were being given the space to reimagine themselves because who they were before really wasn't working and uh, and it was just the most fabulous uh, place that uh, time after time i heard stories of like or saw in people's work how they were this was their way back into the world you know uh, for many people one guy said to me when you are well, when you're sectioned on a mental health ward uh, he said, he said, when I was there at 10 o'clock every day, we all got milk with two sugars. What are the odds, do you think, that 25 people all take milk with two sugars? You know, you lose that ability to make any decisions. And uh, they said that when people arrive at Art Angel for the first time, they're often kind of broken. And, the, and even the decision of choosing, do I use a red pencil to draw this line or a blue pencil to draw this line is a huge uh, a decision for people and art is a way of bringing people back into the world and at art angel every year they do uh, in order to evaluate how well they're doing they give their artists um a piece of paper not a big like multiple choice questionnaire they give them a piece of paper with two outlines of a human body they say fill the first out to show how you felt before you came here and the second to show how you feel now you've been coming here for a while. And I just wanna show you one of these. I looked through a pile of these and they were really, really moving. And there was one that really caught my eye in particular. Uh, which firstly, I think is really powerfully shows the, the power of the work that they're doing. But also for me, I look at that and I think that's what it'll feel like if we are successful over the next 10 years in doing everything that we need to do. That's what transition will feel like. Uh, if we are able to, 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 to create the kind of future that we actually need to create. So that's one of the practices is, the, is this idea that we aren't starting with a level playing field. We are not starting in a society where everybody has equal access uh, to living an imaginative life. And we need to have the, 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 the ability to, to increase that. This is a practice that developed in the transition movement and that I just love. Uh, which is called Transition Town Anywhere, that we co-develop with a, with a community arts organization called Transition, called um, Encounters Arts. The idea is that you start out with a, you need a big room, you need anywhere between 150 and 400 people. And you start with an exercise where you imagine that you are stepping forward into 2030, a 2030 that is the result of us having done everything we could possibly do. And then you think about, so what do I do? What's my role in that future? What am I doing? What do I see myself doing? Um, and then you find other people who share that interest. And then together you work to physically build this town or this high street of the future using cardboard and bamboo canes and sticky tape and string. And you create a three-dimensional living, breathing uh, uh, reality that you then uh, live in and trade in and inhabit and uh, celebrate in and grieve in for the next three or four hours. It's phenomenal to be with 300 adults completely lost in play uh, in a world that they have built is one of the most powerful experiences of my life. We first did it in 2012. I still meet people who were at that that year and, I'm, and I say, oh, I haven't seen you for years. How are you doing? But do you remember that thing we did, the transition town anywhere? And they get all kind of misty eyed and say, oh yeah, Oh, that was so amazing. And lots of them say, and you know, the thing that I played, I'm actually doing that now. You know, there's something really powerful. This is the last time we did it in October last year in Battersea Arts Centre in London. Now this might look to you like some chairs and some cardboard boxes. These young men here in this picture have built the public transport system for Transition Town. They could tell you everything about this, what colour the tickets were, what it ran on, what noise it made, where it went, what the driver's uniform was like, everything. For them, this was a completely three-dimensional, four-dimensional uh, reality that, that they had created. And to 
speak in this sort of uh, play space is just absolutely magical. And I, when the first time we did this in 2012, I ended up with a group of people where we created something that we called the, the Yeast Collective, which was a brewery and a bakery and a mill in the same building. We were like, well, of course the future is going to have that. Why would the future not have that? That's just completely brilliant. And we spent the whole day designing it, you know, what our beers were called, how our training program worked, how our community investment scheme worked, absolutely everything. It was just wonderful. The next year in my town, together with a couple of other people, I started a brewery called the New Lion Brewery. If you're ever in Totnes, do come, best in the West. Uh, you'd be very welcome. And uh, we uh, have grown and grown and grown. And last year, we became one of the UK's very first 100% community-owned uh, breweries. We did a big share launch. We converted to being a community benefit society. We now have 270 owners and we raised the money in order to move the business into the same building as a bakery and a mill. And when we were doing that crowdfunder and people would say to me, yeah, but Rob, how do you know it's going to work? You know, having a brewery and a bakery and a mill in the same space. I said, I know this will work because I played it. I absolutely know this will work. I've played it. Trust me on this, you know, and and there is something where there's something about bringing play into activism that is just really, really important. This uh, man here is called Per Gronqvist. And Per Gronqvist works for the Swedish government. His job title is chief storyteller. The Swedish government have a chief storyteller. His job description is to bring to life the day to day realities of living in a low carbon future to bring to life the day-to-day -day realities of living in a low carbon future. How beautiful is that? Every government should have a chief storyteller. Every organization should have a chief storyteller. We should all have the capacity to be chief storytellers. It's a fundamental part of how we create that longing I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I, uh, I love, it's just beautiful. Chief storyteller. So the, another thing that, that, that is another practice in the transition movement and that is going to be really important in terms of all of this is the ability to ask really, really great what if questions. So this is one of my very, very favorite uh, what if. This is um, uh, from Liège in Belgium. So in Liège in Belgium, the transition group a few years ago came up with a what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? And I love that question. And, and um, the, the, in terms of what makes a good what-if question, my favourite definition of it comes from a guy called Antanas Mokas, who was the mayor of Bogota in Colombia. He said, what people love most is when you write on the blackboard a risky first half of a sentence and then recognise their freedom to write the other half is really what makes a good what if, and what if question. And that question they came up with in the edge was a beautiful question because within the question, there was a glimpse of a different future. It offered a taste, it got people thinking, yeah, what would that be like if that was the case? And it was an invitation for people to step in with their piece of that too. So I was in Liège six years ago. They had this question, they did a big event. They invited farmers and academics and chefs and anyone who cared about food, it was amazing. Then I came home. I didn't hear very much for four years. I went back last year. In that time in Liège, they've created 25 new cooperatives. They raised 5 million euros of investment from local people in those cooperatives. They raised 2.5 million euros to start a new cooperative vineyard. And when I was, I met the guy when I was there who had done this. I said, how did you, how did you do that? How, how did you think that it was possible to raise two and a half million euros to start a vineyard and he looked at me a bit puzzled and he said it's Belgium people like wine people have some money don't be afraid which I thought was the most beautiful advice and I th that was what I took back when we did the, the thing for our brewery it's Totnes people like beer some people have money don't be afraid and uh, so in Liège, they, they have a farm, two vineyards, a brewery. I had to go and visit the brewery. You know, we all have to make sacrifices for the revolution. They started this shop uh, in the center of, of the city called Le Petit Producteur, the small producers. After six months, the shop, first shop was doing so well, they opened a second. They now have four. The, 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 the first shop has now doubled in size. The man at the top is called Pascal. He's the really cool guy who runs the shop uh, in, in the, the, the first petty product tour shop. And I said to him, what's the potential of all of this? How far can this go? 
And he said, I, I think by the time we have 12 of these shops, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. Fragilize, it's a beautiful word in French that I've kind of adopted as an English word. The English supermarkets will start to fragilize. Not, we have to campaign against capitalism and smash the supermarkets. No, 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 we just build something better that people can step off uh, onto instead. When I met the mayor of Liège, he said, we used to say we want to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. This is the story of our city. And we see our role as a municipality as being to remove all of the obstacles to this growing and growing. They're now using Centur Alimentaire as the vehicle to, uh, to reimagine how the hospitals and the schools and the universities uh, procure their food. They've, uh, the municipality did a thing where they mapped all of the land that they own around the city, tested it all for contamination, and then make it available to Centur Alimentaire to find young people or people who want to start new land-based businesses to feed into Centur Alimentaire. You can see a city reimagining its food system but it started with people like us, ordinary people in the places where we live, coming up with a really, really great what if question. And there's been a lovely thing since the book came out to see the number of communities who are now using what if as the frame for what they're doing. I was talking today to a group in Gava and Derry in Northern Ireland who, are, who formed a thing called the Coalition of the Unexpected, who are using what if as the as the foundation of a whole load of uh, work to look at how they build back uh, better in terms of climate and in terms of COVID. And, uh, and I have to thank you guys for the fantastic uh, um, things that you've done, which I've shared all over the place, because I think they're just absolutely beautiful. These what if graphics are just fabulous. And we need so much more things like this, I think, that really uh, use what if as the way to unlock uh, people's thinking about things uh, in a different way. And in Sweden, the Green Party in Sweden ran an advertising campaign for the last election. So that those words I won't even attempt to pronounce, but what they mean is what if. And they just take pictures of things that are already existing in Sweden that give a taste of how the future could be. And they just put what if over the top. So there's that one. <clears throat> there's this one, which I love, which is saying, which really feeds into the thing of you know, a low carbon future is not just about solar panels. A low carbon future is about us having more time, more space, uh, more time for the things that we really love in our lives and the things that we really cherish. And this is my favorite one, which I just think the idea that actually, yeah, what, what if our cities were filled with gardens like this? Uh, and it's not a mad novel idea. Paris, up until the 1930s, was ringed with market gardens that were the most productive use of land possibly in history. Uh, you know, this stuff all works. None, none of it is magic. So <clears throat> I've done space. I've done place. I've done practices. The last one I want to share with you. <clears throat> I'm drinking drink of water because my voice is good. <clears throat> The last one is pacts, <clears throat> which is a weird kind of a word to use in relation to imagination, possibly, is it? Well, hopefully not. This woman here holding the microphone is called Gabriela Gomez Mont. And Gabriela Gomez Mont works for the mayor of Mexico City, or she did until very recently. And she, uh, she designed for the mayor of Mexico City something that was conceived of as a ministry of imagination. It was called the Lab Laboratory for the City, but it was conceived of as a ministry of imagination, which sounds like something out of a Harry Potter book. But in Mexico City, that's what they have. And half of it is made up of transport engineers and planners and people like that. The other half is made up of poets and filmmakers and writers and creative people. And their, their role is to safeguard the imaginative well-being of the city, to, to create the conditions for the imagination of the city to flourish. And when I interviewed Gabriella for the book, and uh, if any of those of you who read the book, or if there are people I've talked about uh, during this talk and you thought they sound interesting, uh, the interviews that I did with them are all on the website robhopkins.net. So you can find the whole interview I did with Gabriella, which was so, so interesting, uh, on the website with a little podcast too. She said to me, she said to me, imagination is not a luxury. And so far, at least three people have sent me T-shirt designs that they read the book and they loved that expression so much they had it designed onto T-shirts. She said, imagination is not a luxury. We should not only be building cities for the human body, but also for the human imagination. The more we distribute the capacity to imagine different futures, the better off we will be. And this is in Bologna in Italy, where 12 years, in 2012, 
someone went to go and see the mayor. Said, on my street, there is a bench. I would like to paint that bench a different you realize that for me to get the permission to do that will take me six months and I will need to go through nine different government departments uh, in order to do that. And uh, at the same time, they noticed that engagement in democracy had been falling really steadily. So they came up with the idea to create what they called a civic imagination office, not a civic engagement office, not a civic participation office, a civic imagination office. And in six neighborhoods around the city, they, they created civic imagination offices. And what they do is they're like a laboratory. They run big visioning exercises, community participation, open space, these kind of things. And they work with the community to come up with great ideas. And I said to the guy, Michaela Delena, who had founded it, I said, why did you call it a civic imagination office? He said, at the beginning, I was very skeptical about using the word imagination because I thought we needed a very practical approach to the people's problems, needs and capacity. But after two years of working on the ground, I have learned that imagine has become one of the most used words in our assemblies. The people want to imagine new ways to solve problems. Imagine is a very simple word. Everyone understands what it is. It's a clever way to speak about how to solve problems in a new way. The really smart piece about it is that when they run these big events and people come up with ideas, the municipality work alongside them and say, that's a really great idea. <clears throat> let's make that a reality. Okay, we can offer you this, this and this. You can offer that and that. Good, let's make a pact. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts that range from making a garden on a street through to we're going to take over this empty office block and turn it into a school to train young people as classical musicians. We, are, we have all become so accustomed to, on the rare occasions that our imaginations are invited, to them being kind of marginalised and sidelined and kind of belittled a little bit. We go along to a consultation and we write our great ideas on post-it notes. We go home and they all get thrown in the bin and they carry on doing what they were going to do anyway. You know, meeting in the imagination halfway with respect is fundamental to us seeing uh, an expansion in the imaginative capacity of the world of so that's what I wanted to share with you today. It's the Imagination Sundial. As I said, there's an article where you can find out more about it. I feel like it's something which should will work at many, many different levels uh, as a way of unlocking lots of things. So I just want to finish uh, before we go for questions with a little story. So just before the lockdown, I went to Germany near Munich, up in the mountains, and I was invited there by Patagonia, the clothing company. And... Um, who are seen widely as being one of the world's most sustainable companies. They do amazing stuff. They're, they're, they're really kind of um, <clears throat> leaders in terms of using sustainable materials and uh, ethical working practices. And they give a lot of money to, to environmental campaigns and campaigners. <clears throat> but as an organization, they had come to a point of thinking, are, do we act as if this was a climate and ecological emergency? Can we put our hand on our heart and say that every day we work as an organization as if this was a climate and ecological emergency? No, we don't. We absolutely don't. And, and how could we? So they invited me and I went and I did a workshop with them one evening. Um, we did lots of exercises and games and I kind of gave their imaginations a bit of a workout. And then the next morning we did this exercise that I called the walk of what if. And I put them into groups of six. And I said, the overarching question of our conversation is what if in everything that it did, Patagonia acted as if this was a climate and ecological emergency? That's your overarching question. So within that, the invitation is to take a walk in the snow and to come up with as many different uh, what if questions as you can. There are only two rules. The first rule is you don't need to be constrained by what is. You don't need to be constrained by things as they are now. So don't be thinking, well, does this fit in with our five-year development strategy? You know, does this fit in with the budget for the next three years? No, 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 none of that. Big and bold and, 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 and uh, you know, ideas that take big strides. The second rule was when, when somebody suggests a what-if question, no one is allowed to respond with yes, but. Yes, but is banned. Yes, but is the death of the imagination. You can only respond with yes and, which was something I learned from doing improv. Any of those of you who've done theatrical improv training, it's one of those things that you learn of where, uh, where somebody makes an offer. Somebody will say, oh, do you like my hat? Even though they're not actually wearing it. And you go, oh, 
Yes, and it's such a beautiful hat. And what happens if I turn that little handle on the side? So you build off and then they'll say, yeah, and if you turn the handle, look what comes out the top. And then you go, you know, and you, you build off each other's things rather than rather than shutting them down, you build. So they went out for a walk in the snow for an hour, asking what if questions, no yes buts, only yes ands. They came back after an hour in what I can only describe as a kind of altered state of consciousness. It was quite extraordinary. They were like, wow, that was amazing. And they had like sheaths of what if questions. And then I said, okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna say that end of the room is not really very urgent. And this end of the room is really, really urgent. And in conversation with each other, organize your answers along this continuum. And then they did. And then, but then we all gathered around the ones at the most urgent end. And I said, okay, if there are questions that you see here that you feel a lot of energy to, to work these up, into valid and viable ideas. Pick it up and hold it above your head and other people gather around you to make a group to explore it. We ended up by the end of the day, we had six ideas that Patagonia could implement tomorrow that were really uh, commensurate to the scale of the challenge. It was phenomenal. And it really gave me that sense of how we need nationally and locally and in our communities to create that kind of a yes and culture where people can bring their ideas forward and we build off those ideas uh, and then we start to really create a different uh, future. So I just want to finish with one of my very favourite quotes, which I used to open the book by Neil Gaiman, the author, who said, we all adults and children have an obligation to daydream. We have an obligation to imagine. It's easy to pretend that nobody can change anything, that we're in a world in which society is huge and the individual is less than nothing, an atom in a wall, a grain of rice in a rice field. But the truth is individuals change their world over and over. Individuals make the future and they do it by imagining things. If you want to find out anything else about me and you want to find out about the sundial and other things like that, have a look at robhopkins.net. If you want to find out more about the transition movement, have a look at transitionnetwork.org. And uh, a few months ago, one of my lockdown projects was I started doing a podcast series called From What If to What Next, which is where subscribers and listeners send in their what if questions. And I find the two best people to explore how we might uh, turn that from being a what if to being a what next. It's, it's been a delightful thing. And you can find some episodes on, on my website uh, and it's with Patreon that's three pounds a month or something. And then you get the latest episodes as they come out. And it would be lovely if any of you wanted to join me on that journey as well. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. And I look forward to any comments or feedback or questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rob. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really great. Um, gosh, I feel so <laughs> I feel a bit speechless actually. <laughs> um, I hadn't really, uh, I, hadn't, I wasn't really sure, Rob, whether you would would be willing to have any questions from anybody. But I mean, if you have yeah, got course. ten minutes, perhaps that would be a fantastic opportunity. Um, it's difficult to see actually everybody when we're uh, in in these so many screens so if you do want to ask a question or you have anything that you particularly want to say um it, it's quite nice if you just type the word um stack in the chat box and then we can come to you sort of one at a time we can we can make sure that we uh give everyone a fair chance as to who who put their hand up first or whatever so has anyone has anyone got anything particular that they that springs to their minds that they would love to ask rob or or speak to rob about i love that people are still putting uses for my builder's helmet in the in the yes. <laughs> <laughs> i can't actually see everybody either so it's a bit Simon? tricky Simon? Simon? oh yeah um really amazing talk thanks rob what is fascinating about that and and it looks quite odd now in in the days we live in we're living in is you've got all those people all these things involve people gathering around and and in a transition view you know we were kind of um poleaxed by by covid right as we were kind of gathering momentum with film nights and stuff have you come across any ways of replicating the kind of energy and the kind of atmosphere that you know the, the sort of mass gatherings can bring about online. with virtual or online or you know socially distanced and all that kind of thing 
You know, we uh, about three or four weeks ago, Transition Network did uh, four webinars that were that were in a part of a series that we're doing called Transition Bounce Forward, and they were we called them the What Is uh, series because they were there were three of them. Well, there were four, but three of them featured uh, people from three different transition groups, and the and, and the, the, the exploration was around what they're doing and how they're how they're adapting what they're doing to COVID and some, and they were amazing. So some of them were, I think, you know, there, there is no replacement for getting physical people into a physical space. You know, I, I don't think I've not seen anything yet on zoom that is, that quite has that function of putting on big events and people just turning up. Um, but what was interesting was, was the different stories. So, so some groups, uh were finding that projects they've been doing for a while were really coming into their own at this point so we had transition hive in kent work with deal with it who were who were their neighboring transition group as well who do a big food gleaning project they go out to local farms the, fa the, the the farmer has harvested what's economical they go out they glean and they've been giving tons and tons and tons of food to local food banks during this food and community in totnes goes out to a big local to riverford big local organic farm sorts through their through their grade out distributes it to local uh, organizations and people in food need that's really come into its own during covid then you've got some organizations some transition groups who are using covid as the opportunity to plan things so transition Liverpool, for example are planning to do that parking day thing that i talked about they're doing that in liverpool next year and it's going to be called spark it and they're building relationships with a whole array of different organizations across the city who are all going to go and take parking spaces and fill them with all kinds of crazy stuff they're doing a big crowd funder if anyone wants to help them have a look at look it up spark it it's a fantastic project there were projects like um uh projects who are now using this time to to work with their council on on pedestrianizing places and putting in cycle paths and so so it's like so that people are responding in very very different ways i think I, th I, know, I know in Totnes, you know, some of the projects that we've been doing already are ticking along and are, are doing their thing. It's a tricky time to do those kind of big events that tend to spark lots of projects. And um, <clears throat> I think we maybe need to use it. Um, oh, yeah, we had a, there was a group in Wales who were doing um, who did a whole big sort of distribution of seeds to families during lockdown when, when, when kids weren't in school and had this huge sort of uptake in families growing stuff. And um, so it's, it's, it's not the same, but there are still opportunities, I think, but, but we, I can't wait until we can do big meetings again, but we have to adapt and find new ways, I think. So cool, thanks. Thank you. Rob? Rob, yeah, Rob Ehrlich. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Um, it was fascinating and, and really, really inspiring. Um, but as I was watching, one of the things that I was reflecting on was, and that I noticed, was that an awful lot of the examples that you gave were in cities. I mean, it was Bologna and Bogota and Lille and Paris and, and all sorts of, you know, but it was predominantly cities. And of course, in a city, you have many more resources, people to pull up, you know, money, people. Um, and when you do something, you, you're doing it in a sort of, in a, in a, for want of a bit of better phrase, you can sort of do it more quietly because you're doing it in a small part of the of, of the place, and then you're hoping to grow from there and to attract more people and pull them in. Um, and in a community like Bude, we're we're really remote. Um, we're much less well resourced, um, and. Uh, the changes that we want to bring about uh, will be sort of comparatively much more um, obvious to people. And, you, you know, so there's, there, there, there's a sort of sense that there might be more resistance. I don't mean to be negative about it because no, no. because we're small, we, we're also possibly more flexible and, and possibly um, more resilient in, in some ways. But I just wondered, you know, for a community such as us, which is inherently quite different to some of the communities that you show, you know what what would you advise you know? so, so so the first thing i would say is is 
one of the great privileges of the work that I do with the transition movement is that I get to go and visit transition groups all over the place. I don't fly. I stopped flying in 2006. So I only travel to places I can reach on the train. So it's pretty much European transition groups. Uh, but from Sweden to the south of Spain to Austria and Italy, I visit transition groups and everybody always says, well, uh, you know, if I go to Italy and I say, well, they look at this, what they're doing in Germany and France, I go, well, of course it would work in Germany and France, but it never worked here. And they go to Germany, they say, well, of course it'll work in France and Italy. And, you know, I, 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 showed, I showed mostly urban examples here because they are, they are stories that, um, that are kind of particular to the imagination work that I wanted to share with everybody. But if I was doing my uh stories from the transition movement across the world presentation there would be a real mix of urban and rural and villages and universities and neighborhoods and whole cities and um uh, you know there are some things of course that are easier to do in a city there are some things that are much much harder to do in cities as well you know so something like a local currency like the bristol pound or when you're working on the scale of a city it's much easier to do than than in a smaller place because you don't have the critical mass of people but there are lots of projects that actually will, uh, at a smaller scale, uh, you know, it's easier to get access to land. It's easier to do things. Um, the the the, uh, the the kind of critical people are often much more easy to have access to than they are in in, in big cities. Um, you know, so there are amazing uh, rural transition projects in Black Isle in Scotland. They did a project called A Million Miles project where they wanted to reduce the amount of car use off the Black Isle Peninsula by a million miles a year. Uh, most people commute into work. They got funding from the Scottish government, Transition Black Isle, and they did this project where they worked because they knew the place, they were from the place, they worked with that community. They, they set up cycling support and cycle training and uh, free bike repair and walking and the, the car sharing, all sorts of stuff. They ended up reducing car use off Black Isle by 1.2 million miles, which is equivalent of driving to the moon and back two and a half times because they knew that place. And uh, the thing that we always say in, in, in Transition Network is the stuff that transition groups do doesn't happen by magic. It happens because people uh, like yourselves put you put in your time. And actually, if this stuff was actually properly resourced and communities were not just expected to do this stuff kind of as volunteers, it would make an enormous difference. But you know, there are so many examples of, of rural communities starting new food systems, starting CSA projects, starting uh, different transport systems, car sharing projects. Uh, there was a few years ago, there was a great uh, example where the, where the government created something called the Low Carbon Communities Challenge or something, where communities could apply for 40, 50, 60,000 pounds for projects that would reduce carbon in a very tangible sense. And about two thirds of the groups that won the, the, the groups were, were transition groups who did the most amazing project in rural places, in the middle of cities, all over the place. So, so, I, so I would say, yes, of course, you know, any transition group I meet anywhere will say, there are some things that it's easier for us to do here and some things that it's harder for us to do here. And, uh, and there will be things imbued, of course, that will be harder, but there will be some things, there'll be things that you can do. And I, and, and I always think the main, the main thing that I always try and have in mind that we had tried to have in mind since we started in Totnes in 2006 was to come up with projects that were a story, to come up with projects in Bude that people everywhere else of Cornwall will go, do you know what they're doing in Bude? Uh, have you heard what they like? So the very first thing we ever did in Totnes was this crazy idea that I came up with, which was uh, a project we called Totnes, the nut tree capital of Britain because you can grow more protein and carbohydrate a hectare with hybrid walnut trees than you can with organically grown wheat. And why we don't plant them through our cities was just a mystery to me. So, so we, uh, we started this project and we just started planting nut trees through the town. And we called it not, we called it the Totnes, the nut tree capital of Britain, which I just love the kind of audacity of it. And no one else has challenged us for that title yet. So as far as I'm concerned, we still are. But things like that, I think, which are really bold and tell a new story uh, are really, really important to do. And, and my sense is that a lot of the things, particularly to do with food, you know, we, like before COVID, those conversations around, we need to be setting up local CSAs and new local food networks was kind of seen as sort of, well, you read The Guardian, of course you think that, you know, it's a kind of seen as a bit of a sort of a progressive thing. Actually now, 
I think that after COVID, these things are much, much more, um, the, the need for these things is much clearer and much more urgent. And so I think there's a really, this is the time to be really bold with what we think of doing. Philippa? Oh, hi, Rob. Um, yeah, brilliant speech. Thank you very much. Um, we're, just, we're just starting off with Transition Viewed. And so I just was going to ask your thoughts on, do we start with something big or should we start fairly small and kind of build up? What, what would be your advice? Um, I would, my first piece of advice would be uh, that there is a really good, finding the link to put it in, a really good guide that we produced at Transition Network, which is called the Essential Guide to Doing Transition, which is a free download, which kind of distills uh, most of the, 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 the learnings that we've found from this movement across the world, what works for getting started. So you'll find some really useful uh, stuff in there. Um, I think the reality is, is that you, is that you, you need to um, start where where there is energy to, to start. You know, getting small wins under your belt rather than taking on some hugely ambitious thing that's going to kill everybody. Uh, you know, getting two or three things under your belt where you're like, yeah, we did that. And people start saying, oh, do you know, that was Transition View did that. Uh, really helps to kind of give some confidence and, and, and to keep bringing new people in. Um, so, you know, if if you're in a place where everybody is really enthusiastic about food you know chances are you're not going to start a community energy company you know you you, you need to pick up and run with what there is energy for but i would say you know this sort of process and, and these tools for doing that kind of future imagining stuff and then the what if questions and then trying to build up which of these what if questions feel like they have the most energy around them and the graphics of yours that i included in the talk i think are beautiful and uh, you know in terms of if you lay all of those out on, you know, which are the ones that people feel, yeah, actually we should do that. Yeah, why, what if uh, all the verges had wildflowers on? What if we, you know, whatever. So to identify, to generate more of those and then to say, well, which are the ones that we feel the most energy around and let's organize ourselves and do that. And then, and then see where we're at after that. And also just the other thing I would say that one of the big shifts that we had in Totnes was that when we started, I would say we, we worked as environmentalists who had a sense of uh, we know what this town needs. What this town needs is to reduce its carbon footprint and we're going to come up with smart ways to do that. After a few years it shifted to say what does this town feel it needs and how can we help it achieve that through doing transition. So we now have a project called Transition Homes which is going to build 30 houses using local materials for people in, in local housing need. We have an energy company which is about producing energy for, for people in need. When we started doing the brewery we didn't say let's think of this as a kind of a community project run by volunteers. We said no we want this to be a thing that creates jobs for people because this town needs jobs and we now employ nine people and it's growing all the time. So, so it, for me there's something about what does this town need and how can we, what does this town tell us it needs and how can we do transition while, while, while meeting those needs? Um, maybe last question from Sarah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Quite, quite quiet, but just about, yeah. All right, okay, I'll try and speak louder. Yeah, I remember, um, I remember in the 1970s, um, Friends of the Earth motto was think globally, act locally, I think. And um, I, I mean, I have to say, I agree with everything you say and, and every, all these ideas are brilliant, but I'm, I'm just a little bit concerned about how easy it is to ignore small communities that are going to all these efforts and doing all these brilliant things. That is terrific. But meanwhile, the Amazon's on fire and the permafrost in Siberia is melting and we only have 50 years until we actually start running out of insects. Um, what, what is the evidence or experience, if you like, that these schemes that are done on a community level are actually influencing those people who are responsible for some of these horrific things that are happening around the world? Because to be honest, I don't think it is ordinary people 
that are responsible for some of these horrific things. It is the decision makers, the politicians, the millionaires. They are the ones who are responsible. So how, how can we stop these brilliant ideas and all this effort that people are going to from being just completely ignored by mm. the people in authority? Great question, thank you. Yeah, um, well, so I would never for a moment suggest that tr the transition movement is the only thing that we need. You know, we need international action and in governments making really uh, binding international agreements. And actually uh, the, the statement by China a couple of weeks ago that it's going to uh, go for, for zero carbon by, uh, by 2060 is a huge kind of leap forward actually in terms of kicking everybody else up the backside. Um, so we absolutely need that kind of level. We need, we need national uh, action. We need a kind of a, a space race of, of, of nations taking the lead on this. We need the stuff that we can do as individuals. We need businesses, big companies making an enormous shift in what they do as well. It's a, absolutely, it's across the board. And I wouldn't for a moment say that the, that the transition movement is, is enough uh, and somehow is the only thing that we need. And we have to be, as you said, you know, completely honest that, um, you know, if this was a football match, it's half time and we're losing three nil, <clears throat> and we're realizing that actually the referee was uh, had taken a bung anyway, and those two penalties were there's no way they were penalties anyway, and uh, you know, but I've seen enough football matches where teams come out from three nil down and can come back and win five three to know that it's possible. And the thing that I know is that in that dressing room at half time, the ma the manager didn't come in and say, "Well, it's probably too late, guys," and uh, you know, I. Uh, you know, actually, we, we, we have to what, what you do is you have to dig deep and appeal to the best in people to do what they can do. And to and uh, what my sense is that the, the transition movement can do is that because it can move really fast and it can move really nimble and imaginatively in a way that national governments can't. It is able to start telling stories that actually give permission to politicians to act in a different way. And while in the UK with our current appalling uh, uh, defunct political system it's hard to see that you know I spend a lot of time in Belgium and France and Luxembourg where it's where it's looking really different and um, the the um, the transition movement there is spreading all over the place the number of transition groups in Belgium increased threefold last year there are people who have come through the transition movement and now who are now in local governments and national governments Brussels now has a minister of ecological transition a minister of economic transition uh, in France there was a huge in the last uh, regional elections municipal elections the the ecology the ecological parties and the municipalist parties swept across the country there are now green mayors across the country many of whom uh, are very inspired by by transition things because I go and visit them uh, in Luxembourg I was in Luxembourg and uh, you know met with ministers there who are who are being really ambitious about what they do next and so a lot and a lot of that comes from the fact that they hear and see stories about transition and it kind of gives them a sense of that's what I came into politics to do actually um, and um, recently the, uh, I met the, the, the deputy mayor of Paris uh, Celia Blauel who said when I started working here for the mayor of Paris eight years ago I turned up on my first day at work with a copy of the transition handbook and everybody thought I was completely mad she said and now they've all got one and the mayor of Paris for the last elections in her in her speech to launch her election campaign gave this beautiful speech that was something I might have written that was all about imagining Paris as a 15 minute city where everything that you need is within a 15 minute walk from where you live and the air smells really nice and there's this and there's that and there's local food and da, 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 da. you know so actually I think there are places where you can start to see how the transition movement and the ideas uh, and the stories they tell are starting to impact on politics. One of the reasons I think for that in France was an amazing film called Tomorrow uh, or Demain which some of you might have seen which was huge in France in a way that in the UK is almost impossible to imagine. That film showed in mainstream cinemas across France for five or six months. And there were loads of stories of people who went to screenings. There was a follow-up film called Après Demain, which you can find on YouTube if your French is any good, where, where people came out of that film and no one wanted to go home. And there was like hundreds of people in the cinema car park after the film 
all standing around saying, so what are we going to do then? What, 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 then? And then there's loads of projects that have come out of that film. So uh, what we need is a film like that here. It's something that, that touches the blue uh, paper, touch paper in, 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 in the same kind of a way. Um, yeah, and there are many examples, I think, you know, of, of things like, you know, in, in the last government, the, the, in, in the last Labour government in its last days, there was a community energy strategy that was created that was at that time, there was this explosion, a lot of them through transition groups of community energy projects where local people were investing in community energy projects, uh, putting renewable energy capacity in place. Transition Network was part of writing a local uh, community energy strategy about how to amplify that, which was going really well until the current government cut all the feed-in tariffs and snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in a spectacular way. You know, but that was a story that started with communities and grew and grew uh, and, we, and gave emboldened the, the government to look at community energy in, in a completely different way. So, um, of course, communities can't do everything and communities are just one part of the puzzle. But what communities can do is that they can tell stories, they can, they, they can normalise uh, these things and they can really kind of lead by example. But there's no guarantee that, that, that this is going to be enough. You know, like Joanna Macy always says, you know, there's, there's no guarantee. You know, we, we, we do the work that we do because we have to do it. And, uh, uh, and there's no guarantee. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rob. Um, I find that all very inspiring. And uh, I think there's obviously, uh, there is a huge mountain to climb. We all know that. Um, and I think that, you know, there are lots of different people doing different things in different groups, all aiming for the same thing, but in very different ways. And as Rob talked mm. about earlier, you know, there, there are lots of people who are looking for system change as well, which is, you know, alongside this rather than instead of. And I think Absolutely. there's definitely room for everything in, in uh, what we do. So thank you very, very much. Um, we, we, it was a nice unexpected little bonus, actually, Rob, having a little bit of um, question <laughs> and answer time at the end. So that was my pleasure. Fantastic. And, and, and do you. keep and do you keep me posted? You know, I like the the thing with the transition movement is always has always been that uh, the invitation is for people to to start transition groups and the resources are free. There's no annual membership. If you would decide you're a transition group, you're a transition group. But we only ask uh, one thing, which is that people share their stories. So it would be lovely as projects develop and you have stories to share about what's happening in Butte, please do share them with the wider network because if transition is anything, it's a network of storytelling and that needs input from everybody. So good luck and-, and, and Thank you. Interested. We sure will. Hopefully we'll have um, some, some great stories to tell. Thank great. you very, very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we were, um, as I said at the beginning, we were going to have a little break now for a, a you know, comfort break, but um, we haven't got very much time. So I think we'll probably skip that if that's okay with everyone. Don't worry, you're not going to, you're not going to hold on for too much longer. But we do have one little exercise um, that we would like you to, to take part in. Um, obviously, as Rob talked about, um, you know, it's, it's um, all about imagination and uh, I hope that, you know, we've been using our imagination listening to him and, and being inspired because one of the things that I found was really fantastic about that was so many of these things are actually happening so you know it's imagination mixed with reality isn't it uh, when we when we formed our uh, initial group uh, we each did this as, a, as an exercise and we did it in some detail and if you visit our website you actually can read our visions um, you know it might be quite a nice little thing to sort of get your imagination really fired up but what we thought we'd do is pick everyone up into some smaller groups, probably about four. And uh, we we're going to imagine uh, that we're moving forward uh, 10 years. So in 2030, and in that time, we're going to imagine that the radical changes in order to help us to become carbon neutral have happened. And we're going to imagine what our town would be like in 10 years time, what, what's changed about it. The sort of how are we getting around what sort of things could you hear see smell what's got better and maybe what do you miss um and really how do you feel about your town now now that all these things have happened you have to kind of imagine what has happened and then imagine how that's made you feel so we're going to break you all up into smaller groups and you'll get about 10 minutes it's been it'd be nice if you 
to have a, a minute or so just to kind of introduce yourselves to each other but, but fundamentally it'd be nice if you can just get into the exercise of, of doing your imagining and then we'll have a 10 minutes or so to feed back afterwards and, and sort of round up the evening so uh, I think Jackie is going to press the button hopefully and get everyone split up into uh, breakout rooms and we'll see you all back here in 10 minutes or so. I mean, I think the, the talk from Rob definitely, but hopefully that little session as well kind of whet your appetites a little bit and uh, made you feel a bit excited about the possibilities for the future. And uh, I don't know if anyone would like to, um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone would like to share anything um, while we're all back together before we before we wind up for the evening. Has anyone got anything that they'd like to share that they learnt from their little chat in their rooms or? Anything exciting, interesting, things that surprised you? Well, Meredith, had his, had his hand up. Um, yeah, I'm just talking about the kind of things that uh, we were talking about in our group, were better connectivity in terms of transport. So cycle routes, maybe reintroducing trains, um, car sharing. And also co connectivity in communities, so more community space, spaces for people to meet and talk. Some people were relating stories from uh, COVID lockdown times where um, people would sit in their streets and talk to one another, where normally they'd be far too busy to do that. So that was another thing, more relaxed time, time to spend with friends, neighbours and family, and time to spend in nature at the moment. Um, most people are rushing around from A to Z from morning to night, just trying to get things to stick together. Um, and, uh, and the other thing was more local food, um, of course. <laughs> that was always mm -hmm. going to happen in a conversation that I was in. <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> I'll let somebody else speak. Rob, did you want to say something? Well, yes, I mean, I had a, a slightly strange one and that we didn't really talk about ideas going ahead because um it was just two of us and alice was is from the isle of man um where they had a transition group and for various reasons i think she's lost her voice she could only type so um but she talked about the experiences there and that the experiences are all in the chat thing so if you look alice quail to everyone um She's typed all her experiences there. Um, and the really in interesting thing was, um, well, I mean, instructive, was they went into it with masses of energy, did loads and loads of things, and then they burned out. And um, it became, you know, one or two people uh, needed to pull back because they had too much on their plates, left a, a smaller core group who then couldn't take it all on. So I think there's just sort of something quite instructive from that, that, um, you know, it's about spreading the load. Um, it's great, you know, she said it was the sort of the enthusiasm at the, at the beginning, sort of so the, the, the eventual demise three years later. Um, uh, so, you know, it is, it is about spreading the load, I think, and finding lots of people, involving as many people as you can in the, in, in the sort of movement building and the, um, infrastructure of it all. Excellent. Uh, Claire, did you have something to say? Yes, um, there were only two of us in our group as well, uh, but we talked about it being a much happier place. Bude would be a much happier place if, if all of the projects that we are hoping to achieve have, have, have come to fruition. Um, there'd be children playing outside, there'd be improved mental health, there's more people walking and cycling, there's seeds being provided to families to grow. There's people uh, helping out others whose gardens are too large. Maybe schools sending the ch some children in to do some of the gardening in the schools. Mixing the ages, so maybe the nursery uh, classes and the old people's homes are spending some time with each other because the generations benefit so much from each other. Uh, better transport links as well with electric buses and electric bicycles and, and the like. And one really important key element of it was something that Rob was saying about it not being sackcloth and ashes. 
this future of ours. If we focus on the things that we'll be gaining. So if I give up my car and join the car club, I won't have to pay tax or insurance. I won't have to have a garage. You know, all of these things are, are possible and, and positive. So if we focus on the positive rather than the, we won't have this anymore, then it'll be easier to bring people along. Anyone else? It's difficult for me to see hands going up. So if anyone just wants to pipe up, that's fine. Yeah, so our group, um, again, talked about food security and food being produced within 30 miles. And um, when we talked about smell, we talked about pollution and things being clean. So the sea being cleaner, the rivers being cleaner. Um, and our what if question around that was to do with what if we dealt with our sewage in a different way? <laughs> Which I, I wondered whether Rob had ever had that as a what if question before. <laughs> Um, and we also talked about um, you know, being able to cycle to places, hearing children play a bit like Claire's group talked about, um, and um, having our own power for Bude and that kind of sense of pride in our own community and empowerment of our own community as well, because we're responsible for ourselves. Ooh, yeah, nice. excellent. Okay, well, if, uh, if everyone's done all the feeding back that they want to do, maybe we can wrap things up for the evening. Now, obviously, you know, exciting as all this is, the, uh, the next thing is to try and bring some of these things to actual fruition and start actually making something happen. And for those of you who live in and around Bude, um, the, the process for that hopefully will start when we have the second of our two launch events which is on Saturday the 17th of October at half past 10 in the morning be obviously another zoom thing and uh, there's there's uh, details in the chat about that but also that it'll be all over our social media and we'll be doing lots of promoting for that as well uh, and on our website um, but I think it's very important that we are very keen to uh, make sure we do spread the load and definitely I take on board what Alice is saying and I think you know lots of us have been involved in groups previously that have started out with great gusto and then it's it, you get tired and we all recognize that so I think the whole thing really here is that you know if everyone comes along on the 17th and uh, we can build a really big um, resilient group rather than a very small group of people who are just going to wear themselves out in, a, in, a, in no time at all, then that's exactly what we'd be looking to do. So do do please try and come along to the event on that um, on the 17th, because that's when we really will start making things happen, or at least getting the groups together and getting people involved. And obviously follow us on our Facebook page, our Instagram, all those kind of things. Um, and please also sign up to our mailing list because that's where you will know absolutely for sure that you won't miss anything. So if you do all of those things and hopefully we see you on the 17th, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that um, next time we ask uh, to Rob Hopkins, it's because we'll be telling him what a great, successful, wonderful town viewed has become since we all got together and made all these great things happen. Uh, thanks ever so much for joining us. I know it's gone on, well, it's not actually gone on any longer than we hoped, but it's been a bit different to how we expected. So uh, I hope no one's sitting there too busting for a wee or anything. You're off, you can go off and do that now and have a drink. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, unless anyone's got anything else to say, um, that's going to be it for us tonight. Actually, Claire, you did. Um... Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody who filled in the survey and we're currently analysing the results. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Yes. So the survey and also tonight is going to be the basis for our next get together so please please do try and come along to that as well it should be a really great day and there'll be lots more a lot more interactive than today today was we were so lucky to get Rob I'm sure you'll agree he's a great speaker and uh, we we're really lucky to get him to come along and speak for us but next time you'll all be much more involved <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, good night everyone thank you thank bye you bye. Bye.
Do you want to stop recording, Jackie?